Dr. Ann Angela. Thank you for being here. Well, good morning. Um, I'd just like to introduce Anne real quick. Um, she's an associate professor at MCDB currently, and she has many awards and honors, but I thought I would really point out the ones that are related to today's topic. And so she's received the Exceptional Mentor of the Year Award from OGPS, and also she's uh, um, received a teaching award um, for outstanding, te outstanding teaching of undergrads. And so, um, she was a graduate student at Yale, and she TA for two courses, and was a guest lecturer, and also developed several workshops. Um, during her postdoctoral fellowship at uh, Madison, or University of Wisconsin-Madison, she was a guest lecturer for several courses, and then now in MCDB, she uh, splits her time between teaching and running the lab. So I can get started with the questions that everybody submitted first, and then maybe we can proceed into an open session and take questions. And so I think the first question that a lot of people asked is, how do you manage to balance or split or somehow divide your time between not only teaching and running a lab and also being able to do outreach and still you know, have a personal life on the side? Yes, uh, yeah, I was circling how many times somebody said balance on the RSVP, fee RSVP feedback, and it was, it was many times. And I have to tell you, I don't have all the answers for this because it's a constant struggle for me uh, as well. And I would say, like, over the course of a year, that balance changes. And we were just saying a little bit before the session started that the word balance is like a tough word, right? Because I think it you know, it sets up this uh, teeter-totter situation where you feel like both of them have to really be equally in balance, teaching and research, or personal life, personal life yeah. and work life. And that word kind of sets you up for feeling like you're failing all the time. So um, I think some other words that I like more are like continuum. Um, you know, things are, you're like moving on this continuum, but some times of the year you might have to be heavier on the research aspect, and other times of the year you're more on the teaching. Okay, right now I'm going to just focus on my family and recharging myself a little bit. You're, you're always shifting uh, within a continuum. Or another one that I had uh, liked in a, a time management book I read was like Mosaic because we're, it's not usually two things we're balancing, it's like all these parts, all these aspects of our life. So um, I would definitely say that over the course of any given year, like I said, um, my, my time is spent in different ways at different times of year. So my teaching load in MCDB is I teach um, half of a big undergraduate course that's called our service course. So for my first years as a professor, I co-taught a, a senior level cell biology class that had been in place in MCDB for a while. So I you know, rotated in, we changed which textbook we used, um, but I was able to get lecture notes from the, the previous people and um, that was really helpful. And then since I got tenure, I've started teaching a, a new class that I had been arguing for for a while. Uh, so squeaky wheel gets the grease. <laughs> so um, I'm teaching a, a, a new intermediate level cell biology class that I'm really enjoying. And this is my second winter teaching that. And then the other semester, I teach the entire semester of a small seminar class um, that's about whatever I want it to be about. So this is the ideal situation. Um, you know, it takes a lot of time, but um, I can have it be about cytoskeletal dynamics, which I'm really interested in. We do a lot of primary literature reading. It's more like a grad level style class for senior level undergrads. And so during that semester, you know, twice a week, every week I'm teaching the class. And so it, 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 it is taking a, a high amount of time. For the other semester with the service class, it's, it's just half of the semester. So I try to, you know, during the other half when I'm not teaching, really focus in on my research side. And then during the half I'm teaching, the teaching takes a lot. And then, of course, the other um, things that are taking a lot of time are when writing things come up. So grant writing, paper writing. Um, and, and other kind of service requirements, which get to be more of a commitment as you move up in rank. So um, I'm now organizing a national conference, international conference. Um, I have more kind of service duties within my department and within graduate programs. And so you have to kind of like find time to fit those things in too. Yeah. So 
I am a list maker, so uh, I always have like a long laundry list of things to do. But the other thing I really try to do is prioritize like you know the things that maybe don't have deadlines but are really important. Um, keep those on a separate list. Like in my office, I have a whiteboard, and so I put those things on my whiteboard list so that I see it every day, all the time, and kind of you know remember in my mind, these are the things I really need to be working on. So that grant deadline is still a while in, in the future, but I need to really start building the framework for that. I need to be talking with my lab members about key preliminary data we need to get. I need to be laying the groundwork for any collaborations we need to have in place. You know, like the deadline is not on us yet, but I need to carve out time to do this. Um, and then the there are all, always these things that have immediate deadlines, right? So those have to be dealt with. And I think for teaching, yeah. like it just keeps coming at you. And it can take up as much time as you kind of let it. And so you have to have some discipline. So I'm kind of a procrastinator. Um, so I'm one of those people who like need that deadline yeah. to get something done. So do you have any selfishly any tips for well, someone, you know? Yeah. I mean, deadlines are great, and sometimes like making self-imposed deadlines or talking with other people about when you plan to get something done so that you're accountable, I think that's a really good strategy because, um, you know, I'm sure a lot of you have seen like these time management squares where you have uh, urgent, not urgent, important, not important. Have you all seen this? And so a lot of times we get stuck doing these things that are urgent and, and important perhaps, or we get stuck in the things that are urgent and not important, but they have a deadline and they have to get done. Um, and then we don't spend as much time as we should on the things that are not urgent but important. So maybe if we can make ourselves some artificial deadlines or so you know, kind of move it into that category, I think that can be a good strategy. I think you know, for grad students and postdocs, like um, finding meetings to attend can be a good strategy uh, because then that moves it more to the urgent in terms of getting your poster in good order, trying for a talk, and you know, um, so that way you have a little more motivation to get to that next thing, yes. as opposed to seeing it as just well, I'm here for three years or four years or five years. That's right. Yeah, yeah that's a really um, good tip, actually. So when you're Trying to balance all of these things, do you find that you know if you focus on one thing, it takes away from another? How do you deal with this constant tug of war feeling, where it's like maybe I'm not doing enough, am I doing enough? This feeling of not quite catching up to where you need to be, or something. Yeah, I mean it's hard. Um, I think uh, I try it. So in terms of like managing my time on a weekly basis. I, I, I try to front load the week, so I try to get a lot of stuff um, scheduled in the first couple days, so I feel like, you know, things are getting done. Um, you know, teaching, like, it is, it is what it is. It's, it's when the classes are scheduled. Um, so this semester my class is Tuesday, Thursday from 11.30 to 1. I actually prefer to teach earlier in the day if possible, because on the days you're teaching, if the class isn't until 11.30, you're probably going to use the time from whenever you get in until 11.30 to do your last minute preparations, right? If the class is at 9, you're going to go with what you had the night before, right? Um, but students don't like classes at 9, so... Uh, <laughs> so, um, on this, those days that I'm teaching, um, I also try to schedule my office hours right after when I teach, because um, one of the reasons I really enjoy teaching is that after I teach, I kind of feel this energy or something, um, especially if the class has gone well or I feel like the students were getting it, you know, you feel kind of energized. And if you're thinking, you know, about like research, teaching, like if, if you enjoy that feeling of teaching and, and making a connection with students and it energizes you, then that would be a good reason to try to include teaching in your, um, in, in what you're doing in your career. If teaching like totally freaks you out and you hate every minute of it, then that would not be a good idea. But, um, I generally feel energized. There are some days when I don't, but um, then I like to do the office hours right after teaching because then it kind of just keeps you on that, you know, that teaching okay. mode. Okay. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, I have my lab meeting on Mondays because that's usually a day that people are kind of getting set up for the week and we do a lot of live um, frog embryos is what we work with. And so 
for the people in my lab, um, they're not doing as much live imaging that day, so that's a day when we can have a meeting, and I also like it. To, let's just it's do it on Monday, yep. And then I also try to schedule other meetings, kind of tile them in during those first couple days of the week, leaving Thursday and Friday with more open blocks, because I would say that's, that's a challenge as a professor, is finding chunks of time when you can work on those things like the writing projects that are in your not urgent but important category and just you could fill up all your time with meetings and stuff and never get to those things. Yeah. So I try to front load the week. That's a really um, good piece of advice. So moving on to the teaching part, uh, a lot of questions focused on um, one, how did you get the teaching, teaching position but also um, how you prep for a lecture. So maybe we can first start with um, how you got here. So a lot of questions had to deal with, as a postdoc, how do you find that teaching opportunity, um, but also maybe how do you communicate with your PI that you want to teach and that you need to take time away from lab to find that teaching opportunity. Yeah, so maybe starting with as a grad student, you probably have, well, you might or might not have teaching built into your yes, grad. I do. Uh, you're just saying yeah. that, yeah. So in my department, students um, are asked to, required to teach uh, for two semesters. Um, in the CMB program that I'm part of, it's one semester. In pathology, it's zero semesters. Yes, yeah, because we don't have any courses Right, to right. Teach. So, um, you know, if as a graduate student, you think you're interested in getting some teaching experience, um, you know, uh, there are different ways to do it. So if you, if you have it built in, I think GSI is a great way to do it, and choosing a class that is matched with you know your area of expertise and um, with like actually having student contact where you're really running the show, if that's what you're interested in doing, I think that's great. If you don't have that opportunity, there are other things you can do. I think um, CRLT has a lot of great opportunities where you wouldn't actually be classroom teaching, but you would be learning about teaching. Yeah. And that was definitely something I did both in grad school and postdoc, is I think most big universities have great learning and teaching centers. And so I was involved with the one at Yale when I was a grad student, first attending you know, sessions like this, and then later um, helping facilitate, like preparing future faculty sessions. Um, and, and so that was a really good experience. And then at University of Wisconsin-Madison, they have a great program called the Delta Program. Some of you might have heard of Joe Handelsman, um, who's done a lot of work in, in, in scientific teaching, using the scientific method in our teaching to make our students really do kind of curiosity-driven uh, projects and, and kind of think like scientists, even if they're not doing research science. Um, so she had been at Wisconsin before she moved on to other positions. Um, so I got involved with their programs, and I think as a postdoc, I didn't have built-in teaching requirements, so I didn't do like any whole semester things, but I did guest lectures, like you said. So what I did is I told my advisor initially, like when I, I think it's good practice, when you start a postdoc, you want to talk with your advisor about what you think your career goal is, it may change, but so that they know in terms of setting up a research project that you might take with you if you want to start your own lab, and in terms of getting some teaching experience, if that's something you care about. And so I had told my advisor, Bill Bement, like, you know, that I was interested maybe in a liberal arts college, maybe in an R1, I wasn't sure. Um, I went to a liberal arts college for undergrad, Gustavus at Alfred College in Minnesota, and I had a really great experience there, and I had some excellent teachers. And so, you know, that was kind of the environment I had come from and, and um, knew, th knew that I, I liked, I wanted to have teaching be part of what I was doing in the future. So Bill was more than happy to let me guest lecture for him, you know. Oh, because he taught uh, a course. He, yeah, so he taught, he taught a big undergrad cell biology course. And so it was a win-win because, you know, he would go give a seminar or speak at a meeting on occasion, and so I would guest lecture for him. Um, and it, it took care of his need to have a sub, and it took care of my need to get some experience. And um, so I would sit in on a couple lectures before it was my turn, so I'd kind of see his style and what the class was like. It was intimidating, because I had never had teaching like that. It was like 200 <coughs> students, big lecture hall. Bill is a unique individual, if any of you know Bill Bement. Um, and his style is different than what I knew like my style would be, so I couldn't quite, I couldn't be Bill, but that's okay. Like I, I, I tried to, you know, incorporate 
like some continuity with what Bill was doing, but do it in my way. Um, and so the the first time I taught, I taught a, a lecture that was kind of more in my wheelhouse, and then the second time I taught, it was a little bit um, further afield, which was good. And um, he, you know, gave me advice, and he was he was a great mentor for the teaching too. And then after I had guest lectured for my postdoc advisor a couple times, I also let some other people in the department know that I was available. Um, and so I guest lectured for a couple other things too. And one other thing I would say is um, with that Delta Teaching Center, the other thing I did as a postdoc was um, try to lay the groundwork for applying for a faculty position. So um, I, I went to preparing teaching statement uh, workshops a couple times, and so I kind of got my teaching statement all written um, before I ever went on the job market and like had them give feedback and stuff, so that when it's actually time to hit the job market, you can focus on the research aspect and kind of have the um, teaching statement uh, ready to go. So one thing you would advise is definitely, you know, going to these centers that are there to help yeah, you with this process. Yeah, for sure. So yeah, a question that a lot of people ask was um, what advice you have for people who do want to pursue a career in teaching, either the way that you do it, where you, you, know, you teach and both run a lab, or specifically where you just only teach. How do they set themselves up for that, and um, how do they show that they're really passionate about it in the interview process? Yeah, so for MCDB, I've been part of faculty search committees, and um, we require, we, we ask people in their applications to provide both a re research statement and a teaching statement. And those teaching statements are very varied, and the amount of experience people have is quite varied. And that's okay. Like, we're not looking for people to have a lot of teaching experience, because we, we know that, you know, what, what we were just talking about, the opportunities can can be more or less. I think if you're looking at a more teaching focused college than like um, University of Michigan and the grad school science department, then you might need to seek out more teaching experience. Um, and there are some really good ways to do that. Um, there, I'm forgetting the name of it, the ERACTA postdoctoral fellowships. Are people familiar with those? ERACTA is a, uh, I forget exactly what it stands for, but it's an NIH funded program that is teaching focused uh, plus research postdoctoral fellowships. University of Michigan has one that is joint with um, physiology and engineering, I believe. It's actually all biomedical sciences. Oh, now. it's expanded. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so Michigan has one, and then a bunch of other schools around the country have them. So if you go to the NIH ERACTA website, you can see like where all these ERACTA postdocs are and they provide funding so it's attractive to the research lab that you would be looking for that you come in as a funded postdoc but you're also getting significant teaching experience both learning about teaching pedagogy and then actually teaching real classes in partner small colleges that are near the university that you're at so that's one way to, to get more experience the other thing is um, like we have precedents for postdocs teaching whole courses in spring summer session here at university of michigan cool. and i think probably other places have things like that too if there's a teaching need and you have the experience and expertise you might be able to teach a course um, if there is a small college nearby they might be looking for an expert teacher so um, i think you know, there would be ways to get more significant teaching experience, but it's going to take a huge amount of time. So then you'd have to have that trade-off with your research. So what we're looking for at University of Michigan MCDB for teaching statements is interest, primarily. Like that you've, that you've shown that you've done some teaching experiences and that, you know, that, that also includes mentoring for sure. So that's another thing I would really recommend as a grad student and postdoc is when I write a teaching statement now for my tenure package, or when I, on my CV, am talking about teaching, I'm thinking about one-on-one -on -one mentoring with my students, too. That's an important part of teaching. So that's something you can definitely get as a grad student and postdoc is mentor undergraduates, or if you're a postdoc, mentor grad students in the lab, and do it in a thoughtful way so that you can actually like write about it in your teaching statement. Yeah, experience. kind of use use the students you're mentoring as guinea pigs for the future grad students you're going to have, like try some things out that you might want to do. Um, and so I think that's what we're looking for is like a thoughtful teaching statement, like that you've actually considered it and that you're interested in it and you want to grow. Um, 
that we, we certainly get candidates who appear to have no interest in teaching, and then we're like, well, you're not really a good fit for our department. Um, so I think uh, showing some level of, of experience, but mostly interest is what's important. Could you compare and contrast that with someone, um, because you also applied for positions in a med school where there probably wasn't a teaching requirement, so could you compare and contrast you know, how these two um, search committees might look for different things? I think it really varies in med school departments, because you know, um, in some other med school departments here, there is a fair amount of teaching too, right? Um, like in CDB, right. for example. Um, so, uh, I had two different teaching statements. One of them was the one I sent to grad schools and one was the one I sent to med schools. Because when I was applying to med schools, I didn't want it to appear that I was more focused on the teaching. Right. Yeah. Um, so I had a, a little bit more like pared down teaching statement that I sent to med schools. Um, and you know, I think another important thing you probably know about is just that the financial model is really different at med schools versus grad schools. And so I get 75% of my salary covered by LSNA because of the teaching that I do. That's a big part of my job, and so I get paid for it. Um, and so that means that I only pay 25% of my salary off my grants. Mm -hmm. And when you're thinking about an R01, paying 50% or more of your salary off your R01, like you have to at a med school, is a big hit to your grant, which really means that you need to have two grants um, to run a decent sized lab. Um, and so, you know, I would go back to kind of what I said before that if you really like teaching and that that's something that you enjoy and energizes you, being at a place that covers a larger percent of your salary for doing teaching can be a good thing. Yeah. However, it takes a lot of my time. Yes. And so, you're getting paid for your time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so um, you might not be able to have as large of a research program or as many grants as you would at a medical school when you're just focused on the research. So you should have to determine what your own priorities are and then go off of your own interest. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, moving towards starting your own lab and establishing a productive lab. Um, um, one question that came up often was, how do you choose the right, quote unquote, right people to join your lab? Yeah, that's a tough one. <laughs> okay, so I brought um, this book that I found very helpful when I started my lab. You know, this one, At the Helm, they have a whole series of, they have At the Bench and some other ones too, but I, I thought At the Helm was really helpful when I was starting out. Um, and one of the, the, one of the main points that they make in this book is that when you first get to that lab and you're setting up your stuff, the desire is to just fill it up with people right away, but that that is a dangerous thing to do and that you have to be filling it up with the right people and um, that it's better to kind of grow more slowly and intentionally rather than just fill it up with random people because those first people you get are so important for kind of setting the tone of what your lab's about and how hard everybody works and how collegial you're going to be. Um, and so choosing people that um, you think meet the expectations you have and that are going to be a good mesh with you and the lab culture you want to make is really important. Yeah. So for grad students, you know, I think um, being in a place like Michigan, uh, you've got excellent grad students. So I, I knew that and wanted to like get my lab rolling on strong grad students. And I also knew that being at a place like Michigan, it was going to be a little harder to recruit excellent postdocs to the middle of the country when, um, for some the reason, the coast so seemed to be so popular. Um, and so I was cautious about taking postdocs, you know, uh, until I found the, the, the right ones. And, and so my lab kind of grew first with grad students. I had a K99R00, which was nice to give me some additional funds at the start. So I hired a technician right away too. Um, and she was very instrumental and helpful in getting the lab off the, off the ground. Did you have like a specific, sorry, did yeah. you a vision um, before you even hired people? This is what I want my lab to look like or the culture? Or the yeah. Environment? Yeah, I mean, I had been in two great labs for my grad school and postdoc, and so those were the cultures I knew, and you know, there were things that I liked about those cultures yeah. and things I didn't like, and so I wanted to, I had definitely thought about like, you know, what aspects I wanted to take from the labs I'd been in and what I might want to do a little differently. So I, I definitely thought about that. Um, hiring the technician was very nerve-wracking because, um, 
you know, you only get to have an interview with them. You don't get a rotation like right. grad students. And so I, what I did was, uh, in, in this book, there's a whole section about questions to ask. So I considered that. I got like 60 applications. Um, so I initially, you know, narrowed it down and then I interviewed three or four in person. And then the thing that I did that I think was probably the most helpful was called some of their references on the phone. Mm -hmm. Because you can get letters and you can try to read between the lines about what people are really saying, but they're more apt to tell you the truth uh, <laughs> on the phone than in writing. Mm -hmm. And so that was really helpful for me to have some phone conversations with references. Um, and then, you know, the in-person interview was really helpful too to just kind of get a sense of... If you would mash it, yeah. you can make it. Uh, when you call those people, did you do it before or after meeting the, the, the applicants? Like, to, you, you called the references to, to narrow the pool or I did, afterward? I think I did it after because, after. yeah, especially for the person I hired, I remember, yeah, that I had, you know, a couple of questions or, you know, things that had come up during the interview that I wanted a little more clarification on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I think you could do it either way. It, it, it's it's kind of time consuming, right? If you're yeah. going to be calling a lot of people and trying to set up things, but I think it's time well spent. And then for the grad students, something I would say is it's very overwhelming that first year. So at a place like a R1, usually the first year is, if, you, if you're in a teaching department, you have release from teaching. So the first year is focused on getting your lab set up. So I didn't have to teach. I, I had just a small teaching thing for a grad class my first year. and. Um, so you have all these new people in your lab. I had my technician, I had five rotation students the first year. And it was very overwhelming because all of a sudden, and I had some undergrads too. And so I felt like I was designing experiments for like multiple people because everybody was green and new and we were just trying to get our equipment working. And so that would be something, if, if you're a postdoc getting ready to start up your own lab, I would really think about what those first rotation projects can be. They are not going to be able to do the same uh, difficulty of experiments that you are able to do right off the bat. So you need to think about some things that it can kind of plug and chug, you know, um, initially to get things rolling. Um, and, uh, you know, just so that you're not overwhelmed when all of a sudden you have some people in your lab who want to do experiments and are excited and you're like, I'm not sure what to have everyone do. <laughs> Um, so if you can lay the groundwork for that at all as a postdoc in terms of getting some reagents ready, you know, doing cloning, getting stuff so that you have some stuff that's ready to go, uh, that would be very helpful. And then it sets up a productive rotation yeah. for both you and, yeah. and the student. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, so the rotations are great in terms of choosing the right people for, right, because, for grad students because you have time to check them out, they have time to check you out, and you can figure out if it's a good fit. For postdocs, again, um, it's more challenging because it's the shorter interview. So what I usually do with postdoc candidates is the postdocs that I have, have uh, had in my lab, I've actually met in other ways. So I've met them at meetings or when giving um, seminars at other universities. That's a good um, meet them outside yeah, of just an interview. For sure. So uh, my first postdoc, I met him at ASCB. I went to his poster because I was interested in the topic. He came to my talk, we both liked it, we Skyped, he was in Japan at the time, so it was a big deal for him to move himself and his family and for me to make that commitment, but I felt like through our in-person interaction and our Skype, it, we were good. Yeah. The, the uh, next postdoc I met because she went to one of the faculty lunches after I was a seminar speaker, and then she applied to my lab, and I was excited because I liked her, and I, I had her for an on-campus interview. Another thing that I, I did for that student, and, or that postdoc and other people is um, getting a couple other colleagues to be in on the interview and come to the talk and meet with them okay. is really helpful when you're just kind of trying to figure out how to yeah. interview people and feel people out. Um, if you can get a, a trusted, another senior colleague to meet with them and get their opinion, that, that kind of can be helpful. I mean, in the end, you have to decide what is right for you. But It's good to get a second opinion. Yeah. Another thing I would say about those startup times with getting the lab culture off the ground and stuff is just start have, like, having lab meeting right away. Start defining what your lab is about. Um, you know, even when it's a very small group, at the start I gave lab meeting all the time. You know, like we would do journal clubs or I would, 
you know, talk about, about something that I thought we should do, and then as people started, you know, getting stuff done, then they would give research updates, and, and we, we would kind of change the format of lab meeting a lot over those first years as, as we were growing and people were getting more expertise and stuff, just to kind of make it work with who was in the lab and where they were at. But um, I think just starting to have that structure, like we are a lab, we meet. And then the other thing is, I think um, building camaraderie is important. And so I definitely started doing lab outings and activities and fun stuff because I thought that that was important if we like each other and we know each other as people, we're more apt to work together well in our science. Awesome. Um, I have a question about how much you care for independent on, of the first students. Because when your lab grows and there are all the students that sort of can guide them through the process, then you are sort of at top, right? You, you can rely on your other students. But at the beginning, those first students, how much you value that they show independence? Yeah, so um, my first two students were both very uh, unique individuals and, and uh, you know, in, in their level of experience and their personality styles and they were both great. They were just, you know, I wasn't looking for one particular thing, I guess, at the start. Um, I was looking for people who were curious and hard workers and had, you know, were excited about the science and, um, you know, had had the right kind of foundational skills to, to do well, but um, I guess I wasn't looking to have somebody who was definitely independent. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so in terms, <coughs> sorry, in terms of um, the time that you actually put in along with the grad students, uh, the first couple of years, are you basically like doing most of the work in terms of getting the publication itself out, or is that going to take time because you let the students actually get up to speed and like, you know, those things. Yeah, so I, I still did um, a, a fair amount of bench work like my first year and partway through my sec second year and then probably when it came to about the third year I started e easing out of the lab. Yeah, Cause, because the, se the first year was really about getting the lab up and running and getting some people recruited. The second year I, my teaching started, so it took a huge amount of time preparing a new class, two new classes. And then the third year, um, it was kind of grant time, uh, right? So I had this K99 that was running out, and so that was when I really pushed it into gear to write an R01. Um, and so what was the rest of the question? I mean, I was just asking, saying yeah. that if the students are actually taking time, which they will, the yeah. first couple of students, or yeah. the first time you're starting math, so you are having to put in more efforts, I'm assuming, the first yeah. time you're So. <laughs> You know, I had I had some projects that were kind of partially done from my postdoc that we started out with here, and so um, the first papers, um, the very first paper, I, I mostly wrote that paper, um, but my student had made strong research contributions. But we kind of we needed to get that paper out to be competitive for the first R01, and so now I really like my students to write the first draft and have more ownership of the project, but in that case, we kind of needed to get it done. <laughs> well, so building off of teaching your first class, um, so originally you started off with a class that already existed and then moved into teaching a class mm -hmm. that you really wanted to teach. So what was it like um, for that second part, putting together a new class, preparing for, is it a lecture-based course, this new course? Um, that your uh -huh. intermediate cell biology. So, how what was the process in preparing and developing lectures? Yeah. Course? So, yeah, this class is like a 200 level cell biology class, um, and we have lectures, and then we have a discussion section that's run by a GSI. So, I the first thing I did was I contacted some people I know at other like institutions and ask them about how they teach cell biology and whether they do senior level classes or intermediate level classes. And part of that was to convince our department that we should do the intermediate level class, um, that other places were doing this too. Um, but then also to get their syllabi and learn what um, textbooks they were using and what kind of things they were including. So, you know, just kind of doing some research about what's already out there. And then you have to choose a textbook. Um, so, like, I uh, looked, I, I w 
looked through several options and considered, you know, like what content I liked, what figure style I liked, what extra bells and whistles they offered. And then um, I, I, I'm working with a co-teacher, so we had to figure out like, you know, what topics, we can't cover everything in the textbook, so like what are the core things that we want to focus on and who's going to do what, and how do we want to make this class different from like our senior level one, like what's going to be appropriate, what's going to, who, who's our audience, I guess, and, and what do we need to um, offer them for this class. So for this class, we really wanted to um, reach out to students who might not be CMB majors, um, as well as students who might. Um, so we wanted to make it accessible and, you know, kind of spark interest in this field so that maybe they would want to do research in this field or maybe they would want to go on to a major in this field. They're sophomores, they're still deciding. Um, but we also wanted to make it accessible to other majors who might, this might be their only cell biology class, um, but it, we wanted them to get interested in the field too. So, um, one of the, so I try to kind of each semester, even once the class is developed, like, you know, when, when it's a brand new class, you're trying to think about all these things that you want to incorporate, but I guess once it's more steady state, each semester I try to, like, do something new, some innovation, and um, so one of the things I've been doing this semester is, I, I already like to do this, but um, I, I, in each lecture I include at least one and maybe two the scientist behind the science slides um, because I feel like in our textbooks we, we see a lot of scientists who have made important contributions to the field. Um, some of them are Nobel Prize winners, some of them, you know, uh, are, have made other contributions. A lot of them are white, a lot of them are male. Um, and so I especially try to highlight scientists Diversity in science. behind the science who are a little more diverse. And I try to highlight first authors of papers, you know, grad students and postdocs too, so that they're a little closer in level to the undergrads who are in my class so they can see, hey, I could do this, you know, I could that's contribute. Cool. Yeah. Um, so that's one thing I'm doing this semester, trying to do more of. Yeah. Yes. So that first year, uh, you have a room, you have an idea and a dream. <laughs> how do you get people? Uh, yeah, okay, so how do you get rotation students and stuff? Yeah, so I think making yourself visible on that new campus, like, I am here, I have started my lab. And so, you know, every grad program has, like, welcome picnics and speaker lunches, you know, uh, faculty lunches maybe where the uh, rotation students are checking out who's available. So I just tried to put myself out there as much as I could. Um, go, go to the picnics, go to the lunches. Um, if there's an opportunity to, like a rotation mixer where you write a little paragraph and go around and talk to people, I just went to all that stuff so people would know that I was around. Um, you know, if there are poster sessions for a thing, like actively go around and talk to people at their posters. Um, so those wouldn't be the rotation students, I guess. but. Um, yeah, just make yourself visible as much as you can, both on the campus, and then I think, like I said, for my postdocs, the, the way that I've gotten them is being at national meetings and, and going to talk to people. Um, so I think putting yourself out there. Did you build a blog website right away, or? Yes, I did actually before I got here, um, and it, you know I think that is. The lab roster is just kind of depressing. It's just you. Uh -huh. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, th I think, like, I've definitely seen, like, brand new labs where they, they, they say, you know, that, that when they're starting their lab and have the website open even before they start it just so that people know, or if you're on Twitter or Instagram, like, letting people know I'm starting my lab, I'm looking for people, you know. Okay. And you mentioned that the first year you had five rotation students, that seems a lot. <laughs> Did you do you think it was, like in hindsight, do you think it was a good idea that, because at least you got to choose or it was too much and you would not recommend? It was a lot. So the other thing I would say to answer your question and your question is making sure you're associated with graduate programs that have a influx of students. So my department has a direct admit program and then I'm also part of CMB program and so like when you're new to an institution, making sure that you associate with any grad programs that are a good fit so that different students would know about your lab and potentially be interested in your lab. And as far as having five rotation students, it was like a lot, but um, 
I, two of them, you know, ended up joining, um, and that that was great to start start the lab off with with two students. So, if I would have had, you know, a, and another one who didn't join ended up being second author on our first paper out of our lab. She made like an important contribution. So, like uh, you could get great experienced rotation students who actually are actively contributing to research. So, I think. Trying to get multiple rotation students is a fine idea. It also depends, I guess, on the, the length of the rotations. Can you talk more about, you kind of mentioned like between your second and third year, like that transition when you're like not actively the one who's really doing the experiment. You kind of have to gain this trust where you're like, okay, I didn't do this experiment. Trust maybe isn't the right word, but like when you're not, not the one not the driving force behind yeah. making that transition. It's weird, and it, you know, it's, it's hard to let go of that a little bit. Um, I think a lot of us in this field are kind of type A personalities, and we like to, you know, have control. And, and you, so you have to trust um, that, that uh, what your lab members are doing is rigorous, and, and how do you know that? Because you've taught them. So in the start, I, you know, I would spend a, a lot of time training people, especially on, you know, the key, like, uh, Zenobus injections and uh, the microscopy, and I would do hands-on training. Now, I have more senior lab members who help train the junior people, but I know that, you know, my senior people really know what they're doing. Um, so, yeah, it was a little bit weird at first, but I think um, what I do is I try to, I, so for people who've been in the lab for more than a year, we meet every two weeks for a kind of formal one-on-one -on -one meeting. And for people in their first year, we meet every week. And we use Evernote, um, and I have them write a summary of what they've been working on for the last week or two weeks, um, and drop data, raw data, into the Evernote, or, or we look at it on some other for format. So I like to be able to like see it when it's still fresh, before it's been processed and quantified. Um, so that, you know, even though I, I'm not involved in directly doing the experiment, I'm seeing the results early on so that we can try to catch if there's anything weird going on or if this isn't the right way to go about it or, oh, did we actually do the control we need to? This doesn't make sense. Um, so I feel like um, I, I started realizing that even though I wasn't doing the experiments, I would still get really excited when somebody else would bring me that result. And um, one, one nice thing about it, once the lab grows a little bit, is I felt like when I was doing the experiments, I would have a lot of mood swings depending on whether yeah. my experiments were working or not. And when you're PI and you've got multiple people in the lab, it's nice because usually something is working. <laughs> so it like, evens out your <laughs> feeling a little bit. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it was, you know, it was kind of a gradual stepping back of things and then kind of trying to put into place this framework for making sure that, that we talk about fresh raw data um, and then figure out how we're going to analyze it and, you know, so that we're not, I'm not just looking at it in, in lab meeting or something. And part of that also uh, came up because that was the same timing as when my second child was born. And so I was out of the lab a little bit that fall, and that's when we started using Evernote, actually, so that I could still communicate with people, and then we really liked it, and so that's what we continue to do now. Um, so sometimes everything goes well, and it's nice and pink and rainbows, and sometimes it does not. Do you, have you had any employees in your lab at any level that did not work out and how you do you deal with that early enough so that it does not affect the, the culture of the lab and relationships and, and how do you actually deal with that person because it's also a person you don't want to you know, just put it away. Yeah, uh, I mean I think kind of personnel management and, and this is like one of the hardest things about this job and something that you're not fully prepared for. and. 
you know, like on the more positive side, like even just giving feedback, like giving feedback to those first five rotation students feels really weird. Like you have to do this evaluation and you're just not experienced with that. So that's again something, if you can try doing that at all with your students that you're working with as a postdoc, so you have a little practice with it, I think that would be good. So I did that with my guinea pig undergrad student, Billy Weber, thank you Billy, um, <laughs> where I, I practiced giving her evaluation um, while I was a postdoc, and so I think that helped a little bit. Um, so I'm, I'm lucky uh, that I haven't had to uh, like fire anyone. Um, part of it I, I want to point out too is making really clear expectations from the start and trying to um, you know, to deal with things before they become a big problem, I think. And part of this came out of the Delta program at Wisconsin again, which is the advice to make a lab expectations document, which I give to every new, new lab member um, that kind of sets out my lab philosophy and core values for our lab so that they know what, what is expected of them from the outset. So this includes um, what I expect from you, research progress, literature review, communicating your work with others, participating in lab meetings and departmental seminars, collaboration within the Miller Lab and beyond, applying for independent funding, professional development, work schedule and vacation. And then it includes what you can expect from me. And so we try to have a conversation about this from the outset so we know what the expectations are. There have been a couple situations where there's been some interpersonal conflict. I think that's a common thing. And that's been dealt with in different ways. So um, in one case, we kind of, um, a couple people had come to me raising some concerns about some things that were going on. And so then I had, I worked with that person. We kind of set up a action plan for these are some things we need to work on modifying. This is the timeline, we're gonna work on it. We're gonna keep checking in about it. Um, and so I think it, we were able to resolve it without you know, getting to something more escalated. Uh, in other cases, just physically moving people so they're not on top of each other all the time. Moving benches or desks can help out with things. Um, you know, I think talking about authorship early on is a really important one for kind of interpersonal conflict and, and that things may change, but we're, we're gonna keep talking about it and be transparent about it. Um, and, and just talking with individuals in our weekly meetings, if there's some, something that isn't quite going right, again, I, I try to bring it up before it becomes an escalated problem. Um, I had a question. So building on top of that, are there signs or are there specific things you look for in your lab to check the temperature of each person or just the lab environment in general? Um, so now I have a, a senior scientist in the lab who was a grad student with me and decided to stay on. And so she's a great resource in terms of helping me know what's going on in the lab. Um, and uh, otherwise, I, I, I try to talk to the individuals themselves. And you know, um, I, there are certain stress points for everyone, right? Like prelims and paper, and so the people who are at those particular kind of stress points, I try to check in with more frequently and make sure is everyone okay? Yeah. So are you gonna share that, by the way, or would you mind sharing that document that you're talking about? I would be happy to share it. Great, thank you. <laughs> so this was, yeah, shout out to the Delta program again. They did, they had a, a mentoring uh, small group, and I was very lucky that I was the one postdoc in this group of all assistant professors. Interestingly, we were all women who decided to self-organize into this mentoring group. But um, it was very helpful because uh, I was seeing what all these assistant professors were dealing with, what their challenges were. And um, so I kind of prepared this document before I started and then modified it once I you know, actually like realized how things were going. So I mean, coming back to that kind of kind of a document that you have. So when you actually give this kind of a document to new students who actually want to join the lab, are the students actually feeling pressurized, saying that oh my God, there's a list of things that I need to follow, rather than just talking to them and making them feel comfortable? I don't know. I mean, this is kind of my mo. So if they're feeling too pressurized, then maybe 
not right. It's not good. But um, I, I have high expectations, but I try to like give people the tools they need to you know meet those expectations. So and I, and I'm telling them what they can expect of me too. So it's not all like this is what I expect of you, right? Um, so I think I think having like clear and open communication about expectations is really important in one way or another, whether this is the way that feels right to you or whether verbal conversation feels right. One of the things um, offered here that's really great, some of you may know about, is the more mentoring workshops. Um, so these are workshops putting on, put on by the more mentoring committee, encouraging grad students and their advisors to go together to the session to talk about what mentoring entails. It's a two-way street, kind of breaks up the mentors and the mentees for a while and then brings them back together. And one of the main points is to over lunch discuss expectations and how frequently we're going to meet and how authorship's going to work and kind of all these safe topics just to make sure you're on the same page so that you know there aren't surprises. And you know, grad students and postdocs are coming from all different levels of experience and past background. And I think one of the challenges as a mentor is trying to meet people where they're at, right? And um, sometimes if, if you don't like clearly lay out what the expectations are, people don't know. I'd like to build on that question and ask how you um, seek evaluation from your students and how you get honest feedback um, yeah. to know how you can adjust, you know, to meet them where they need to be. Yeah. So in the for for grad students at the end of their rotations, um, for PIBs, there is a section where students can are asked to provide feedback. So like at the exit talk, after every rotation student. Um, if, it, if it's in the PIBS form, or MCEB doesn't have that form, but I ask anyway at the end of the rotation, you know, like, how did it go for you? You know, what could I do better? You know, did we interact enough? Did you, yeah, you know, kind of all, all these questions. And so that's one way, but it's definitely, like, there's always this weird power balance, right? Because I'm giving you a grade for your rotation, too, so I'm sure they feel awkward saying stuff. I hope that they say stuff, but... Um, uh, so that's one way. Um, for, for like more senior employees that we do like formal annual evaluations, there's uh, also an opportunity there to go back and forth that's formalized. Um, for other students, we look at their IDPs or when we're preparing for committee meetings, I think that's a good time to kind of talk about how things are going. Um, yeah. That's, that's a good question. That's a challenging, challenging question. You mentioned that 75% of your salary is devoted to, or it comes because of your teaching. And I was wondering if that was also taken into account in like the 10 year process. Like is, is your teaching evaluations and stuff like that appropriately taken into account or is it like only publication? Oh yeah, it's definitely important for tenure in a graduate school LSNA department. Um, so I had to write a, a teaching statement, a research statement, those are both five page documents, all of the course evaluations for my courses, um, and the, the department when they evaluated my tenure package um, had a section equal length evaluating my research, my teaching, and then a smaller section for service. Now, it's not like, it's not, the three-legged stool is not a third, a third, a third. It's probably like 50% research, 30 to 40% teaching, 10 to 20% service, something like that, I would say, in reality. But it is an, it's an important component in LSNA. And then I would say even, so I would say at the department level, the research definitely has more of an edge. At the college level, at LSNA, they really care about the teaching. So they care about the evaluations, they care about how many students we're interacting with on a, um, you know, annual basis. And so my department does a good job of making sure that we're teaching that big service class and then the smaller class so that we're getting enough uh, student contact to, to meet the kind of expectations that the college has for teaching. But it's, it's definitely an important thing. Another thing, teaching evaluations, they are not the optimal way probably to evaluate our teaching, but they are a way. And um, 
So an important thing when you're teaching is to make sure that you build into your syllabus some points, asking students to fill out the teaching evaluation and giving them some points to do it because you want to get as full of a range of responses on those evaluations as possible. So if you have 100 students in the class, you want to have you know 80 to 100 percent participation because if, if you have a much lower level of participation, you're only going to hear from the students who didn't like something or maybe the students who really loved it. You're going to kind of miss that middle ground. Um, and so giving some incentive for participating in the evaluation is a good idea. Um, coming back a little bit to the idea that as an assistant professor you're working towards tenure and while you probably will like it in an ideal world, you know, there is always a risk that you won't get tenure. Does that affect in any way how you interact with your lab and how, for example, you take new students when you're getting close to your tenure evaluation? Like the idea that you could take on a student two years before um, applying for tenure and maybe not get it and then that student is just left there. Is that something that's ever in your mind or something you take into account? Or I think tenure always is kind of weighing on you those <laughs> first years, but I think you got to just go go forward. Uh, take the risk. Yeah. Um, I think money is the bigger concern, you know, like making sure that you're going to have funding for your students. Um, that, that's the thing that weighs on me more. But, um, you know, usually you get, you get feedback, at, a formal feedback at your third year review, and you kind of, you, you start having a sense of where you're, where things are at for tenure. Um, but making sure everybody's funded is a constant worry. Yeah. So right along those lines, uh, that first year, you're obviously trying to get your lab started and maybe writing your first paper. When did you actually submit your first paper? Um, in my third year. And again, I had a K99 or a zero, so that bought me some time. Probably if I didn't have that, it would have needed to be earlier than that. Definitely see a lot of pressure from other faculty to, to instantly, the, your first year submit grants, and your second year submit grants, and your third year submit grants. So, I mean, there are a lot of um, new faculty awards, you know, that you can apply for, and those are great things to apply for right off the bat, but honestly, I think you need a first, uh, you need a corresponding author paper from your independent lab before you're usually competitive for R01, so that takes a little time. All right, thank you to everyone for being here. Thank you to Anne so much for the